Make sure your Bibles are still open there to Genesis chapter 1. As I said, we're looking at foundations, laying the foundations. That's what this series of Genesis is going to be about. And looking this morning at the doctrines of creation. Like I mentioned, in the book of Genesis, we have the very first day, the first life, first marriage, family, sin, murder, civil laws, and on it goes as God lays out His plan for us. The New Testament is replete with references and quotes and illustrations and teachings directly from the Old Testament. It's been said you cannot fully understand the New Testament without knowing the Old Testament, and you can't appreciate the Old Testament without seeing what the New Testament uh, is reflected in it. So we're laying the foundations for the entire Bible is in Genesis. Whether it be looking at the Jewish nation, whether it be looking about the teachings of Christ, it goes back to what Genesis teaches us. The beginning chapters, the first chapter or two, is about the creation of the universe. The creation of the universe. If the Bible creation story, if what we just read is not so, we can't really put in our trust in any other parts of the Bible. Because it's just as inspired. God did not say, here's an interesting story. No, it, God tells us and speaks to us. We cannot really put our trust in any other thing of the New Testament. In fact, in Hebrews 11, I believe it's there in your notes, it says, through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the Word of God. So even in the New Testament, the great chapters and in Hebrews about faith, it says it's because we know God spoke this Word. Just by His Word did He create this universe. So if we cannot believe God made things, just like He said, we have doubt cast upon the entire Bible. Jesus taught the creation story also. In fact, if you remember there, I think it's in your notes in Matthew 19, 4, they asked him a question about divorce and remarriage, and he said in 19, 4, and he answered and said unto them, have ye not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female, nearly quoting Genesis. And so Jesus says, yeah, haven't you read? He says, you know what Genesis says, you know what the Word of God says. So Jesus taught the Genesis story also. So, as we look at this idea of creation and evolution. Let me say, first of all, this is not a message, evolution versus creation. It's not that. There's a lot of resources, and we'll mention a few things, but there's a lot of resources you can find. We are going to learn about creation and what the doctrines it teaches us and how important it is, but this is not a message, creation versus evolution. But let me just say by introduction a few items. One, there's a great danger if we do not understand and believe the Genesis story of creation. There's a great danger. If we believe as a people, or as a world, that we came from nothing, by nobody, to do nothing in particular, we're headed for trouble. If we think we just came from some slime pool, and we're kind of some in-between evolutionary process, and one day we're going to be something different, and we just came from something lower. So, preacher, what happens if we begin to think that? What happens if we begin to live like that? We get what we have today. And I'm not trying to be unkind, but we have children killing children in schools. Why? Because there's, there's no God. Why? Because we're not somebody special. Why? Because there's nothing we're going to give an account to. Why? Because there's no purpose in our life. We're just some in-between stage from this wrath to something else. And we, so we begin to live like that. If we don't believe that we are made by God and there is a Creator who's got a purpose for us and we will give an account to it, not only will children be killing children, but as adults we'll murder unborn children at the rate of some 630,000 a year just in our country. Why? Because we're just animals. Why? Because we're just part of some evolutionary process if we do not believe what God says in Genesis chapter 1. If we do not believe Genesis chapter 1 that God made us and God has a purpose and some things we'll learn today, then you say, well, what happens? There becomes child abuse. There becomes child pornography. There becomes gender confusion. Let me change that. Not gender confusion, but gender per perversion that we have. Why? Because we're just some sort of animal and nothing really makes any sense and nothing makes any difference. So if we don't believe the Genesis account and think we're just kind of just here by happenstance or God maybe is just kind of watching to see what happens, then what happens is we think we're just no more than snakes and we begin to devour one another and live like the animals we, the world wants us to believe that we are. But, if we believe God, the one true God, made us on purpose 
for a purpose and has a perfect design, then when we understand that and who we are in Him, then we won't, I guarantee you, we'll stop arguing about, well, should I go to church on Sunday or not? Should I go to church on Sunday night or not? Should I tithe or not? Should I read my Bible or not? Should I pray? No, because when we see who He is and who we are and what He's doing with that very basic understanding of those things about creation, we'll say, my, that's what I'm here for is to serve Him. So we're going to be looking at this this morning and just some basic doctrines from creation. But again, this is not evolution versus creation, but let me give you four words that will help you in talking with people about evolution. I'm not going to go deep into it, but let me just give you just four words that will help you think about this thing about evolution versus creation. Number one, word number one is maturity. Maturity. So preacher, what are you saying? God, as we read here, made a mature universe. When we begin to understand, God made a mature universe. In other words, He did not create seeds and let them grow in the trees. He did not create eggs and make chickens come out of them. By the way, somebody, anybody who asks who, which came first, the chicken or the egg, if they're a Christian, they ought to know it's the chicken. Amen. God made a chicken, and then the eggs came. But God didn't have the eggs and have them hatched. God did not make Adam a baby and wait for him to grow up. No, He made Adam ready to make babies. All right. So you say, what does that have to do with that? Because the scientists are those folks that say it takes millions of years to get the light from those stars to here. That's true if it's light started from there. But when we know God made a mature universe, He said, I'm, yes, it takes that long for the light to get here. He said, but I'm going to give you light to start with. Amen? He just made it mature. He made it already there. So we got maturity. That's the first thing when you think about this idea of creation versus evolution. Number two, the thought is transitions. If you want to write it down, transitions. The fossil record does not show any transitions. It just shows these fossils of animals appearing. They're just there at first. Transitions. Here's something easy and easier to understand. In our Christian school, Friday, we had our last day of school, and we had, uh, took them to the field trip to the zoo over in Oakland. And boy, that was an exciting thing. We went to the zoo, and it, there's the elephants. Asked some little, asked the little baby, what's that? That's an elephant. Oh, that's good, that's good, that's good. What's that? That's a zebra, huh? They have, it's a, here's the elephants. Here's the zebras, here's the monkeys, and here's the bears. There was no cages that says, here's the almost elephants. There was no cages that said, this is the giraffe light. There, you understand, if they all came from the same thing, there would be some transition still prevalent. There would be some, but we don't have, we have the elephants, we have the giraffes, we have the bears, we have the monkeys. It's a, there's no transitional elements between the two, because God did not make that way. So transitions. Number, third, number three is dependencies. Dependencies. I'm not going to go, it's been a long time since I've studied that, but the idea of dependency in our universe and in our earth. I take for the example, when I was in Texas, I, was a, I raised bees. And we know that bees take the pollen from the flowers and pollinate other flowers. But we know bees take the pollen then and make the honey. Both are dependent upon the other. No way for that to happen by some slime pool just beginning to develop. That dependency. You couldn't wait a million years. The bees could not wait a million years for the flowers to blossom. And the flowers couldn't wait a million years for the bees to show up before they could pollinate. So it's dependencies. Just dependencies. And the fourth thought is uniformity uniformity. That's a wrong assumption. The, uh, the evolutionary process d believes and deals about everything's been the same all the way through. Here's, wh here's where they think. Whether you're talking about the increase of elements or the decrease of elements or the size or temperatures of things, they go on this assumption. Let's say we have a young man who's 78, 76 inches tall, 18 years of age, great basketball player. And you look and you say, how old is he? Well, you say, how much did you grow last year? He said, I grew an inch. Well, if you're 78 inches and it takes an inch to grow, he must be 78 years old. You'd say, that's dumb. That's exactly right. But that's how the evolutionary process works. They, because that 76 inches assume, would be assuming he started with zero, not 18 inches. It assumed the growth process was the same all the way through. It was not the same all the way through. Guess what? In our society, when they start calculating those things, they assume a uniformity and they assume a base value. As opposed to a mature universe, they try to take it back, have whatever, take a billion, million years to get there. But God made a mature universe, so it starts with a certain amount of elements, a certain amount of temperatures, a certain amount of those things, and it goes from there. And the uniformity, things are not uniform. Guess what? The world changed a lot at the flood. 
the world changed. I mean, all the things, we just see the Grand Canyon. How could that happen? There was a big flood, and it washed it out very, very quickly. We know in our society, one volcanic eruption changes the environment. And so they say, well, it takes this long for the oxygen to do this or the elements to do that. Yeah, until a volcano erupts. Whoa, then everything changes. And so those, those values are based upon wrong assumptions. So those are just four words to help you think about maybe there is something to this thing of creation or maybe that's something to help with somebody that talks about evolution. But there's a lot of other resources I could give you and go out and study it. But this is not evolution versus creation. This is God teaching us about and from His creation. Are you with me this morning? All right, so we're going to, it's vital we understand it, and we're going to see the importance of it. Very quickly, here we go. The doctrines of creation and what it means to us. Number one, we find the person of creation. The person of creation. The one of creation is simply God. God is the creator. I love it where it says in Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God. It, God does not justify himself. God does not prove himself. God does not explain himself. It's just there. It's just assumed because the Bible tells us that everybody knows, even the heathen, regardless of where they are, knows there is a God. And so God just assumes with the assumption that we know there is a God. This creation. So, some doctrine. God doctrine in creation. Number one, he is eternal and immutable. Our God is eternal and immutable. He's eternal. It means He's always been. In the beginning, God created. So before mass was, before matter was, God was. He always was. He said, preacher, you said, preacher, I can't understand it. Of course you can't understand it. We're just human. But always God was. He's eternal. He always was and He always will be. There in your notes, Revelation 1.8, I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and end, saith the Lord, which is, which was, and which is to come. So even in the future, He says, I'm what I was, I'm what I am, and I'm what I will be. Isaiah 43.10, it should be there in your notes. He said, Ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that ye may know and believe me and understand. He said, I want you to understand that I am He. Before me, there was no God formed. He said, there was nobody that formed me. There was nobody that made me. There was nobody before me. Neither shall there be after me. Isaiah 44, 6, I am the first, I am the last, and beside me there is no God. Psalm 90, verse 2, Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever thou hast formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. God always has been. God always will be. What a wonderful thing to serve. I got, that I serve a God who always was, who always will be, who will always be there. He is eternal. So in the beginning, God created. Not only is He eternal, He's immutable. That word means unchangeable unchangeable. God, who is eternal, is also unchangeable. Malachi 3, 6, For I am the Lord, I change not. I change not. Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. God started out perfect, and He's going to end perfect. Oh, I'm glad. Now, as I get older, I change. I, got, I saw a gray hair yesterday. Oh, luckily I pulled it out, so you don't know how old I'm getting. But God never changes. He will not change. And so what? Therefore, I can trust Him and I can count on Him because He's eternal He's not, and He does not change. What God said back here in Genesis is the same thing He's saying now in 2022. He does not change. I can count on Him. I can trust Him. I can believe Him. I'm not waiting for a new revelation. I'm not waiting for a new revision. I'm not waiting for God to change His mind because after all, we're now educated and now we're, society has evolved and things. No, He does not change change. That's why I can stand here and proclaim the Word of God, thus saith the Lord, because He said it once and He's not going to change His mind. That's why you come to the house of God to hear, thus saith the Lord, because you know God will not change His mind. God's the same yesterday, today, and forever. What a wonderful doctrine we have in the person of creation. God, He's eternal and immutable. He does not change. His philosophy does not change. Whether it's CNN or NBC or the Giants who are winning the World Series, it makes no difference to God. He is God. So we can trust Him. So we find He's eternal and He's immutable. Number two, just some doctrine out of the way before we get some lessons about it. He is triune. He is triune. That means He's one God in three persons. One God in three persons. Not three gods. One God in three persons, each equal in God. You say, preacher, that's hard to understand. I, re I repeat myself. Of course it is. We're just human. His ways are higher than our ways. We, we can't... We're the two-year-old asking the brain surgeon to explain what he's doing. 
We can't understand that. And so he explains to us what we can. But he is triune, one God in three persons. That's why it says in Genesis 1.26, we just read it, and God said, let us make man in our image. There's no other collection of gods out there. There's not a collection of different... No, he's talking about that. He said, let us make God in our image and after our likeness. You say, what, who is that? It's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. These three are one. It's there in your notes, 1 John 5, 7. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. These three are one. So when God said, let, him, let us... Make man in our image. He said, we want to make man, and we'll see in a few minutes, in our image, like us, triune. And so the three, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. We see up there in Genesis, the first part. We know the Bible tells us Jesus is the part of the Godhead that created. Without Him was not anything made that was made. We find the Spirit of God moving on the face of the water, and we have God the Father there in the beginning. So it's, it's all Three in one. He is triune. Again, 1 John 5, 7. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. That's what it says, unless you have an NIV. Then that verse is not there. I suggest, on behalf of the Trinity, you get a Bible. Amen. I just thought I'd throw that out there for you, all right? So, 1 John 5, 7. In Romans 1.20 it says, For the invisible, listen, I think it's there in your notes, For the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world, we're talking about creation, are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. That's me, things that are made. Even His eternal power and Godhead, for they are without excuse. So the Godhead is the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Three in one, equal in power, equal in might, equal in godliness, but making up one God. He is triune. So when we read that, let us make man in our image, he's talking about the Trinity. So we find the person of creation. He's eternal and what? Immutable. Eternal and what? Immutable. He doesn't change. And he is triune. Number three, he is omnipotent. He is omnipotent. That simply means all-powerful all powerful. In Romans 1.20, it says, we read this already, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his, what's the next two words, class? Eternal power. Next two words, eternal power and Godhead. God's power is eternal. 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 How long is his power? Eternal. Eternal. This will be a shock for you. I may have, I may have been a little bit stronger when I was 18. I may have been a little more capable of doing some physical things when I was 20 and 21. But now I'm 25, well, my power wanes, your power wanes as the years go by. God's power does not change. God doesn't wait. God doesn't wake up some days and say, boy, my arthritis is bad. I don't think I can do anything today. God doesn't wake up and say, I hope you can make it without me today. No, His power never changes. It's eternal power. He is all-powerful. That's why in Revelation 19, 6, And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and the voice of mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth, all-powerful, all powerful. Hebrews 1.10 And thou, O Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundation of the earth and the heavens are the works of thy hands. Again, you can't believe Revelation if you can't believe Genesis because Revelation, or Hebrews tells us rather, he talks about creation. He said the heavens are the work of his hands. So, because he's omnipotent, I can count on him. I can count on his promises. I can believe he can do whatever he needs to do. He created everything by his word. And all God's people said... Amen. Oh, what a wonderful, the person of creation. That's who we're talking about. And so when I realize who he is, who am I to say, God, I'm not going to do it your way. Who am I to say, God, I can't trust you. Who am I to say, God, I don't think you know what you're talking about. No, he is that person. So we find the person of creation teaching us here in Genesis. Very quickly, notice number two, the perfection of creation. Again, this is just kind of laying some groundwork for all this laying the foundations for the book of Genesis. The perfection of creation. How many understand creation was perfect? Absolutely perfect. 
And even with the sin that came into this old world and the problems, overall, the general creation is perfect. You say, what are you talking about? We phone those, first of all, the placement. The placement. Genesis 1, 16. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. I love, I love that. He made the sun. What an amazing thing our sun is. Absolutely amazing how it's just perfect and how it just keeps generating the heat and the light. Absolutely perfect. And the moon. What an amazing thing that God made the moon to reflect that light and how it rotates around the earth just so we only see just the one side. It's an amazing thing. And he goes, and by the way, he also, he made the stars also. With the millions and millions of stars, God just kind of throws it out there. Oh yeah, he made the stars also. Wow. You know, at one time, science, this will help you deal with science today. Science thought they knew exactly how many stars there were. It was written down. In fact, if you said it was more stars than what the science says, you'd probably be excommunicated out of the Catholic Church in those times because they knew how many stars. Until some guy molded a piece of glass and looked up at the sky and said, Wow, did we miscount? <laughs> That first telescope, that first look, said, wow, wow, look what we could not see. The placement, and it says, verse 17, And God set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. He set them. He put them. He placed them. We look at just our galaxy, and we just look at our part of the universe, and how all the millions and millions of stars, and how they move, and where they're positioned, and how they draw on one each other, and the gravitational pull, and all those things. And you say, isn't it amazing what an explosion can do? It doesn't happen that way. God placed them. Because order does not come from chaos. Order does not come from chaos. It's been said, if you believe that the universe just happens to be the way it is because of some explosion of some bunch of dirt somewhere along the way, that's like having an explosion at the print shop and a set of encyclopedias come out of it. It just wouldn't happen. It just wouldn't, it cannot happen that quickly. So, the details of our universe... Show us the perfection of creation, the placements. God's placed it the way it is. God's put it there. But we find the perfection of creation is not just in the placement, but listen carefully. We find the planning. The planning. And I need you to, if you drifted out to lunch, come on back because this is vital because here we are. God teaches us just in one little phrase right here, and we'll be covering it more because over the next few pages, it talks about it more, and it's so vital today because we're being bombarded with lies about it. We find His planning. First of all, we find God made all the animals after their kind. After their kind. Again, there is changes but inside the species. I mean, you've got beagles and you've got basset hounds. They are different, but you can breed them one for another. You can make horses taller, you can make them shorter, you can make them faster, you can make them slower, but you're going to keep them still saying the horses. So there is that planning. God established the elephants and the giraffes and all those things that do not interbreed. They are after their own kind. But not just after their own kind. Most of us can understand that, and we understand why that is. But notice in verse 27, and the key that I want to mention today in this part of the planning is because of what the world tells us is not God's planning. Verse 27, So God created man in His own image. We'll talk about that in, in a few moments. In the image of God created He Him, male and female, and created He them. God made male and female. Our Supreme Court justices that are trying to get put on the bench, they may not be able to know the difference between male and female, but God does. They may not know the difference between male and female, but Adam sure does. We sure do. God has established male and female. Male, females are not inferior spiritually or intellectually, but they are different. In case you're not aware of it, they asked our Supreme Court Justice, they were trying to put on the board, and they asked, can, can you define what a woman is? And she says, no, I'm not a biologist, I cannot. God makes it very clear, there is male and there is female. We need a conviction based upon the Word of God as the world tries to tell us you can't decide who's female, you can't decide who's male, and you can go ahead and change and go back and forth and wonder about that. We need some conviction to say, no, God made a perfect 
planned universe and his creation, he created male and female. Now, before you get upset, I'm not talking politically. I'm talking biblically. I'm not talking uh, uh, prejudiciously. I'm talking Bible. I'm not talking periodically. I'm talking about Bible. I'm talking about God said he made male and female. And when we get away from God's creation, again, we say, preacher, how in the world can we get to the place where they're teaching little kindergartens who don't know the difference between red and green yet, that they need to figure out whether they feel like they ought to be a boy or ought to be a girl and how it can be changed. Before, how can we get to that stage? How can we come to that place when we're talking like that to kindergartners and we're doing changes of operation, trying to go from male to female or intermixing between the two? How do we get there? Because we've left the place where God created the heavens and earth and made male and female. In other words, you and I must be get the place where we accept God what he said and be glad he made us as we are. If you're a male, be glad God made you a male. If you're a female, be glad God made you a female. And don't try to be the other. Don't look for the other. Don't anticipate to change the other. Be glad with how God made you. But man is in such rebellion to God and creation. He says, no, I'm going to change the very basic creation you made me. We need to understand that clearly because God hates the unisex movement. God hates the unisex movement. He made male and female. And that's why he says he got males act this way and females are this way. He said he, he made Adam, and we'll look at this in the, in the near future. He said he looked at Adam, he says he saw Adam was alone. He said, this is not good. First thing God ever said was not good. He said he saw a man by himself. This is not good. Nobody's there to pick up his socks. Nobody's there to make sure he brushes his teeth. No, no that's him. Just kidding. But, he's, but at the same time, I'm not. He said, this is not good. He said, i got to make a help meet for this guy. He's, he needs some help. <laughs> and he made the two. But they're distinct and they're different. So he wants us to act different. He wants us to dress different. He's got different jobs for that. In fact, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 6, 9, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of mankind with themselves. So God talks about this, lumping this with adultery and whatnot. In other words, improper sexual relations. As effeminate, it mean, the word means soft, and it comes from a word that means little boys kept for homosexual practices. God said, I don't want that effeminate, that soft stuff for the guys. God made us clear. You say, preacher, why are you going on about this? Because the news right now is going on and on that there needs to be a change. They're going on and on that there needs to be this mixture between male and female and you can't tell the difference. And your kids, you are, they're teaching us that you need to ask your kids, your little boy, are you satisfied being a boy? Maybe you ought to be a girl. Are you a girl? Maybe you ought to be a boy. Or we're not going to let, we're not going to let, we're not going to, we're not going to, let our boys play with trucks. We're going to let our girls play with trucks and make our boys have little Susie doll houses. Hello, God. In the beginning, God. God. God's got more coming for us. But see, there's the battle. It's creation. How do we get to that mess? We stop believing God created. We stop believing in a perfection. We stop believing in a plan that God has. And we get chaos from it. Parents, you need to compliment your children in their gender roles also. I'm not saying to stereotype them, but male and female. Male and female. Very quickly, to find the perfection of creation. We'll be talking more because it goes on about marriage and goes on a little bit later. God gets pretty graphic about some things to help us later on. But it was talking about in Genesis. It lays it out. Male, God's planning. God's planning for male and female. God's planning for marriage. God's planning for children. God plans it all. He's got it structured. And His perfection is in creation. You say, preacher, how do we get such a mess? Because we've left God's perfect plan for humans. Very quickly, notice the pinnacle of creation. The pinnacle of creation. So what is the pinnacle of God's creation? Man. Human beings are the pinnacle of God's creation. He made all the plants. He made the, plan, the planets. He made the stars. He made the animals, the beasts, the, the creeping things. And on each one of those, he says, he saw it and he said, it's good. He saw it and it's good. After he made man, he said, it's very good. It's very good. Man is the pinnacle of God's creation. Very quickly, notice man's design. Man's, are you still with me this morning? I'm saying we got to... Parents, you need to talk to your kids. If you have your kids, I have to go back to that. I'm sorry. 
If you've got your kids in a public school where they're trying to teach them that they don't have to be a boy, they don't have to be a girl, they need to figure out their way, you need to teach your kids that that's a lie from the pit. When our elementary schools, like one down just from our, from our home where we live, they have their gay pride week for little first graders. We already know they're talking to kindergartens who, as I said, are doing between red and green and trying to teach them about gender identity. Why? Because they hate God. They hate the idea that God made a perfect world. So if no other reason, that's one reason why we have Lighthouse Baptist School where we, don't, where we teach God's, God made male and female. And each one is special in God's eyes. So we just need to be careful. So be careful about it. So what we find the pinnacle of God's creation is man. God made all the animals, but he made man also, and we are the pinnacle. Very quickly, God's, man's design. Number one, we are in the image of God. That's what it says. He said, let us make man in our image. We are in the image of God. In other words, God says we are different from the animals. We are different from the squirrels. We are different. I'm not saying we're much smarter, but we're different from the squirrels. We're different from the pigs, but we are different. We are made in the image of God. Listen, that is so critical. That's why God's first civil law was capital punishment. But not for killing pigs, not for killing squirrels. Genesis 9, 6, God says to Noah when he came off the ark, Whosoever sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed, for in the image of God made he man. We are different. So the capital punishment wasn't far. In fact, in the law, he says, if you kill somebody's cow, you make up the cow, you give them a different cow. So you kill, he said, but you kill a man, we've got a problem because we're in the image of God. We're in the image of God. That's why we abort chickens, but not children. That's why we butcher pigs, but not babies. That's why we euthanize, I know Californians find this hard to imagine, euthanize litters of puppies that you don't want, but not our parents. I'm not saying being unkind to animals, but I'm saying there's a difference. We're made in the image of God. So before we go about euthanizing, before we go about torturing, before we go about... You say, well, preacher, what difference does that make? Because if we do not believe in this creation that we are unique from the animals and we are made in the image of God, then we have child abuse, we have child pornography, we have all those other perverse things that go on. Why? Because we've left the Genesis account of creation and fighting against it. Again, we're made in the image of God. You say, preacher, what does that mean? It means a couple of things. Primarily, it means we are triune. We know God is triune. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. These three are one. We are triune. Body, soul, and spirit. God made us body, soul, and spirit. You can get a lot of differences on exactly what part is what. We all know what the body is. We've got the body. But the soul and the spirit... Let me give you the next point in the notes and I'll come back to it. Not only are we made in the image of God, we are living souls. We are living souls. Genesis 2, 7, And God made, and the Lord God formed man in the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. We don't have a soul. We are a soul. We are a soul. He did not do that to the pigs. He did not do that to the cows. He, he, he took man, and we became a living soul. So man is body, and soul the soul. The soul that sinneth, the Bible says, shall die. He that winneth souls is wise. What shall a man give in exchange for his soul? That soul is the part that makes us alive to God. It's that soul that lives forever. It's that soul that Jesus, we talk about going soul winning and winning soul. It's that soul. The spirit is our personality. The spirit is our Attitude, it's our, it's our consciousness, if you, the best way you can put it. By the way, I don't pretend to understand all that because I've just got a human mind. But I know animals only have two. They have body, and as I see it, they have spirit. Some dogs have good spirits. Some dogs have bad spirits. Some cows, we've had a cow that had a good spirit. Had another cow that did not have a good spirit. It was just not. But they don't have a soul. They're only two parts. We're a three-part. We are triune. We are, he said, let us make man in our image. Triune, three parts. Not only that, but we can create. We can re reason. We can rationalize. We can choose the sin or not to sin. We have all those capabilities. We are made in the image of God. So vital. But we've negated that. We don't believe that. And we end up with all the perversion and twistedness and wickedness because we don't believe man is any different than the animals.
very quickly. Not only are we made in the image of God, as we saw, we are living souls. We are living souls. God breathed in the breath of life, and man became a living soul. In other words, we are made eternal beings. Eternal beings. From our conception, we will live somewhere in eternity. Amen. We were, by the way, let me help you. We weren't anywhere before we were conceived. Hello. We weren't just floating out there waiting for a body like some cults teach. No, no. When we were conceived, God put, we gave us that life, and we're now going to live forever somewhere. We are eternal souls. Unlike the animals, unlike matter in general, we will live forever somewhere. So I have to ask, how's your soul today? Where will your soul be a thousand years from now? It'll either be in heaven with the Lord or it'll be in hell away from God, based upon what we do, and we'll see in a few moments, with Jesus Christ. But we are living souls. What a difference that makes. Do we understand the importance of understanding in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth and he made male and female and he made man in his image and God says that makes him special and so I treat him special and I look forward to him something in special and we are eternal beings very quickly let's notice man's duties not just man's design but we see man's duties again uh, we could go into many different types of duties but I believe in creation we can sum it down to two categories and all the other things fall into those general categories man's duties in two categories number one you don't think me a, well, I'll just tell it to you and let you think what you want number one we're to steward creation we're to steward creation look at Genesis 1 28 steward means we take care of something that's somebody else's so in 1 28 and God blessed them talking about the men he created man in his own image and created him male and female. And God blessed them and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. So God then says, he said, yeah, he said I'm putting you over the creation. He said, I'm giving you some responsibilities to steward or to take care of creation. First of all, it says we're to multiply. We're to multiply. By the way, that takes male and female also. In case you didn't know that. That takes male and female. to bring. So he said he made male and female. He says, yeah, here's the, he says, in this world, he said, I want you to multiply. I want you to, to bring about more people, more people and fill the earth. And then he says, replenish it. You know, as I looked at that, let me just help you with some thoughts that came to me as I looked at that. Uh, verse 28, verse 28, uh, verse 28, and God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and multiply, comma, and replenish the earth, Common. So it doesn't mean necessarily that they replenish the earth with people, like they would lost those people, but the word replenish there means to fill. So we're to help this old earth fill itself up. We're to care for this place that God has given us and help it fill itself and prosper and grow. So we're to multiply, we're to replenish the earth, help the earth be full, we're to subdue it. Ha! Huh? See, the idea is we rule this world, the world does not rule us. We're to subdue it, we're to have dominion over the animals, we're not to let the animals have dominion over us, we're to have dominion over them. By the way, that doesn't mean we abuse them, doesn't mean we hurt them. The Bible says the righteous man careth for the life of his beast. God cares about animals, but we're to have dominion over them. In Genesis 2, he says he gave, put man in the garden to keep it, to take care of it, and to, uh, to dress it, which means to enslave it. So God gives us as stewards of creation. Our job is to take care and produce use and to guide and to promote this world that God owns and he created. That's part of our job. So don't say, well, we have no right to change this. Well, God gave us, we're to have dominion over it. So, number one, to steward creation. That falls into a lot of categories, but here's the one that covers the one we're talking about this morning, to worship the creator. Our duties is to steward creation, but to worship the creator. That idea of worship covers lots of areas. Very quickly. I believe it's in your notes. Revelation 4.11. There in Revelation. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For thou hast created all things. There he is, creation. Thou hast created all things. And for thy pleasure they are and were created. Isaiah 43.7. Even everyone that is called by my name, for I have created him for my glory. I have formed him, yea, I have made him. I have made him. So, we're to worship the Creator. What do you mean? I am made to give God glory. Amen. I am made for His glory. I am made for His pleasure. That's what He says. And for thy pleasure they are and were created. I was created not for my pleasure, but for His. I was not created for my retirement. I was created for His pleasure. I wasn't created for my vacations. I was created for His pleasure. 
Hello? That's what I mean. And you say, well, that doesn't seem fair. What? He's the creator. He's all powerful. He's all eternal. He's never changing. He's the one who loves us. He made us. He's got the perfect plan. He's positioning us right here. He said, this is what I made you. He said, for my glory, for my honor, and for my pleasure. Oh, when we understand that is my duty, my creator made me that. Oh, then we say, well, I just don't have time for church. Are you kidding? Well, I can't afford to tithe. Are you kidding? Well, I can't afford to do this. I can't afford to serve. I can't afford, I don't have time for this. No, that's what we're here for. In other words, if my life is not giving God pleasure, I'm missing the purpose of my creation. Amen. Yeah, that's not a bad thing. It's a wonderful thing to praise God. It's a wonderful thing to give God glory. It's a wonderful thing to have that relationship with Him. But that's not our purpose. His glory, His pleasure, very quickly, and also His fellowship. His fellowship. God made us to fellowship with Him. I can't imagine why God would want to, but He does. In Genesis 3.8, we'll see in this shortly, not today, but it's talking about Adam and Eve there in the garden. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. So apparently there in creation, God would come in the evening and walk and spend time with them. Because before sin, there was no separation. And so he would spend time with them at fellowship. Why did he want to make man in his own image? So there can be fellowship. I don't think God can get a lot of same kind of fellowship with the squirrels. Oh, I'm sure God loves the squirrels. He likes the squirrels. He made a bunch of them. Just look around. But he made man in our own image. And he spent time with Adam and Eve. In fact, Jesus said in John 17 in his prayer, that they may be one as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee. That they, talking about us, may also be one in us. That the world may believe that thou hast sent me, and the glory which thou gavest me I have given them, that they may be one even as we are one. God created us for His glory, for His pleasure, and for us to have fellowship with Him. To be one with Him. Preacher, how do we get in such a mess? We stop believing what God told us in the beginning. God created. God made. God's plan. God's purpose. And it's a good one. It's the best one. It's the most pleasing one. Very quickly, let me jump a little bit farther ahead. We've got this wonderful thing, man's duties, man's design. But then we've got man's death. Man's death. Man's death is the corruption of creation. It's the corruption of creation. When Adam and Eve were made, they were made sinless. They had the choice, but at that time they were sinless. If they had not sinned, they had not died. He said, if you eat of this fruit, he says, you'll die. But if you don't, he says, you're going to live. You got the tree of life. Well, he said, don't worry about it. So he had that fellowship with him, made in the image of God. But then man sinned. And death came. And creation was corrupted. Genesis 2.17, he said, But of the tree of the knowledge of the good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. And the day they ate of it, they did begin to die. Their death, physical death, was, was signed. Then, of course, we know the first death occurred. God then killed an animal to clothe their nakedness. The Bible does not tell us it was a lamb. I'm just guessing it was a lamb because the Lamb of God takes away the sins of the world and all the sacrifices of the Lamb. But he killed an animal and took the skin and covered them. But man's death, he began to die. That's why in Romans 5.12 it says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, Adam and Eve, their sin, and death by sin, so that death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. You and I die because of sin. Every funeral is because of sin. The wages of sin is death. That's the physical death. We know that. And we're all sinners. Because it's for all of sin. But there's a second death. That spiritual death that God's speaking about. Revelation 21.8 But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone which is the second death. When man sinned, that separated us from God. God in His holiness, in His purity, 
in his perfection, cannot let sin into heaven. He would not be just. It would not be fair. So the place called hell that he created for the devil and angels, that's where man goes. Hell hath enlarged herself. But God doesn't want us to go there. The creator does not want his creating, creation with a soul to go there. So he made a way. That's man's deliverance. Man's deliverance is the crucifixion of the creator. The crucifixion of the creator. In Romans 5.18, For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners. In other words, God says, starting with Adam, from then on we're all sinners. Adam's first disobedience made us all sinners. So, he said, just like that, the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Whose one obedience makes us righteous? That's the Creator's Jesus Christ. Philippians 2.8, and being, talking about Christ, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Romans 5.8, but God commendeth his love toward us, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. With the wonderful creation and all that's done, man chose sin. Sin brought death, corrupting God's corrupt creation. But God didn't want us to go to hell. So he took the flesh, came in Jesus Christ, died on the cross, paid that sin debt for us. The Creator crucified for us. Because of my sin, I deserve hell. But God loved me so much, He died for me, so I don't have to go there. If, if I believe, not with my head, but with my heart, turn and call upon Him and receive that gift of eternal life. Well, I'm just going to be good enough to get to heaven. If you could be good enough to go to heaven, Jesus wouldn't have come. He only came because we're absolutely helpless. So He died for us. Why would He do that? Because He loves us. Because He loves us. Ephesians 1.4 According as He hath chosen us in Him before the foundation of the world. See, God before the found before creation, where it says, in the beginning God created. Before He created, He knew what was going to happen. And He knew we would need a Savior. And He knew He would die for us. According as He hath chosen us before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame. The only way I can be without blame is when I got Jesus' righteousness on my account. And without blame... Before Him, in love. In love. I believe the quote's there from Charles Spurgeon. He said, let me revel in this one thought. Before God made the heavens and the earth, He set His love upon me. <laughs> wow. Wow. So the question is, God made you a soul. That soul will live forever somewhere either in heaven or in hell. The difference is not how good you are, because you're a sinner just like me. It's what you do with Jesus Christ. Believing and calling upon Him that paid the debt for you. It's not what church you go to, not how much money you can give, not how nice you are, but what you've done with Christ. God wants your soul with Him forever. So He died for you. And offers you the gift. What are you going to do with that? Say, I'm going to do it my own way. You'll die and go to hell. Or you say, I'm glad my creator, the all-powerful one, died for me. And offers me the gift of eternal life. Get saved today. Say, preacher, I am saved. Great. Let's get back to the, God's plan for us. God's plan. Of family. Of home. Of marriage. Of relationships. All the things we're going to find in Genesis. God's plan for us. Let's bow our heads, please.